Do you want to be a famous designer, a rich designer, a successful designer, or a good designer? Those are not the same thing. A successful designer, success is relative. You can be, you know, have this multi-million peso empire, or you could have a big shop in some remote province in the Philippines and you're completely satisfied. That's success. You know, my mom grew up in Legaspi and we come from a long line of textile obsessed people because apparently even my great grandmother hoarded fabric and my Lola was, you know, she was a Victorian grandmother. She stayed home, she didn't work. So she was always sewing and embroidering and she had weavers and they would weave piña and husi for, for, their, for their ternos. And then my mom had an elder sister named Purificacion who started learning how to cut from my Lola. Mm -hmm. And then at one point, she came to Manila and studied dressmaking because in the early days, uh, pre-war and, and much earlier than that, there were already dressmaking schools, small ones. Uh, I think the mother of Arti Paras, uh, the designer, uh, was, was teaching dressmaking. And then there was a, a woman called Madame Kollerman somewhere in downtown Manila where this aunt of mine was studying dressmaking pre-war okay. and then I think she came back to Legaspi and and she and my grandmother would make dresses for people so that was sort of the very early start of of that that mm -hmm. that idea of course my mom was younger mm -hmm. and she in 1930 I think it was 38 she 36 or 38 she came to Manila to study fine art um, in uh, UST, and her teacher turned out to be Botong Francisco, mm -hmm. who's now a national artist for, for visual arts. But then the war broke out, and so she went back to Legaspi, and they were there for a few years. And then, I, I guess by the time the war ended, it was around 1945, she was already much older, and I guess it was, mm -hmm. you know, kind of too late to go to college. So she and my aunt came to Manila, and open slims. Okay. You know what? It's very simple. Um, she started by sending her design. Somebody discovered her her designs and published it in the Man was it Manila Times? Manila Times, I think, the Sunday Magazine. Yes. And this was the time she was studying fine art pre-war, mm -hmm. and she didn't want to be discovered. You know, as an artist who was doing fashion design. So she signed her work as Slim. Okay. And people just read it as Slim. And then they started <laughs> writing, apparently, to the magazine saying, you know, these dresses are so beautiful, where can we get them made? So I guess after the war, they said, okay, let's open a dress shop. I think probably if I had to pick one, it's fabric because she was so obsessed with fabric. Um, she was always, I mean, even when we were kids watching her, she was always looking at new fabrics and holding them. And sometimes as I was growing older, she would say, look at this, you know, the way you, you do this and look at the way it's so stiff and you can do that. And so I think if you look at her work, there's so much sculpture that happens on the human form. I mean, even this thing we were just looking at, it's, it's, not necessarily something like, if you look at this dress, it's not necessarily something you would draw mm -hmm. on paper. Yeah. Because uh, she worked in several ways. One was she would make a drawing, but also she worked a lot on the body, where she would pick up the material and start draping it and come up with her ideas and pin it, and then they'd cut it, sometimes directly on the client <clears throat> and later on on the models. So, and, and you having studied, understand, like, mm -hmm. There's certain three-dimensional ideas that are actually hard to render as a flat yes. drawing because you're thinking in 3D. Yes. So I think for me, the, the two most outstanding, I think, if I had to choose, are that idea of, of, of creating new lines and shapes on a three-dimensional form 
And also, I think, for me, her editing was always so flawless. I've never seen a dress that she's done in all the 42 years of work that's too much or too little. It's always so pinag-isipan, you know, very polished. Well, in the beginning, her idols were Dior and Balenciaga. And uh, she opened the shop in 1947. By 1951, she was so successful that she went on a long trip to Europe. It must have lasted months because she was there for a long time, I know. And she, she traveled with two or three female friends and they, they got to watch some of the couture shows of the actual designers from that time, Dior, Balenciaga, Jean Dessais, I mean, Jacques Fath, you know, all the, the designers from that era. So yes, they inspired her. Um, and later on, I know in our high school years, one of her idols was Yves Saint Laurent. You know, designers have ways of admiring other designers. Yes. The one thing I notice about my mom's legacy here is designers looked up to her. You know, she, she was what you would call a designer's designer. Aww. You know what I mean? Yes. Um, and then later in the 80s, I know one of her idols was Issey Miyake. She had signature fabrics depending on the decades of her career. Okay. And that was also reliant on what was currently fashionable. So in the 50s, it was all about, you know, Dior's new look and, and you know, her very avant-garde shape. So she was very partial to fabrics that were luxurious but could defy gravity. I remember one time she was showing me this fabric and she said, you know, this is called paper taffeta because she said when you pull it, it stands up and it stays like that which was, again, very much lent itself to those 50s, very avant-garde mm -hmm. shapes. Whereas if you go toward the 60s, the fabrics were very thick. If you look at the, the clothes of like Mary Quant and André yeah. Courage, you know, they're very thick, sort of very stiff. Stiff, yeah. You know, they weren't so figure-hugging all the time. You know, um, then you go to the 70s, it was all about luxury fabrics, but you know, again, the, the influence of... Language. Exactly. So you have crepe de chines and georgettes. And she was using these silk charmeuse fabrics that had a satin backing that were so weightless that when you, you know, wore, wore a gown made of it, it would sort of flow as you crossed the room. So I think it was depending on uh, the time. In, in the 80s, I remember it was very structured. Yes. You know, the big influences at the time were people like Giorgio Armani and Gianfranco Ferre and Ferre and Montana and Thierry yes. Mugler were all, so it was all very tailored, stiff, you know, thicker fabric. So it depended on the times, I think. Well, okay, let me correct a little bit of misconception. Because um, they always say she was a woman in a man's world. That's actually not true. Because if you look at our Terno book, Fashionable Filipinas, uh, the, the dress, Fashion designers be began as dressmakers, which were all female, you know, more, or pre predominantly female in this country. Yes. And uh, Ramon Valera in the 1930s was an exception rather than a norm, because he was male. Because the Valera brand or label started with two of his sisters, and then he joined them. Okay. So my mom being a female designer, uh, just after the war was not that unusual. And the rise of the male designers were the next generation after her. They were the likes of Ben Ferrales, Aureo Alonso, Pitoy Moreno. That's when it became male dominated. But then it's a shift because in the history of our school now, since, since we took over, I think it's about 80% of the enrollees are female. So I think tides change. Now, discrimination against her, I wouldn't use a word that strong, but uh, she was sort of an outsider in the sense that, th that the rise of the male designers, there were a lot of them already by the sort of late 50s on to the 60s and 70s. And because she was married and had children, she had a life at home. So I don't know if I would call her marginalized, but she wasn't often included in group you know, things. But then, on the other hand, they did have fashion organizations in their time, which came and went also. 
But yeah, if anything, it's because she had a family. What she told me was so many of their clients would say, you should open a school so that we can send our daughters to learn what you know. So, you know, in the beginning, it almost sounded like a finishing school. <laughs> but then what it, it inadvertently became was a trade school, as you know, a vocational mm -hmm. school that, yes. that's very uh, practical in a sense, that, that when you graduate, you're capable of doing everything yourself. Uh, the real business person among, in, in the Slims, name was my aunt, Purificashan. My mother was like me, completely an artist, totally clueless about uh, numerical figures and stuff like that. You know, even when it came to uh, billing the clients, my mom would leave the room and my aunt would come <laughs> in with the bill. You know, so, so I think it was my aunt that pushed her to let's do this slim school. Three completely different things. As a designer, she was very much an artist, sort of in their own world. But also, um, my father was very low-key, very grounded. I think that's what their chemistry was in their marriage. So when she married him uh, and we were born, we had a very normal family life. My father kept us away from the press. And my mom went to work. And when she came home, she was just mom. So it's only when we went to her shop that we would see what she was doing. It was comp kept very separate. Uh, in fact, somebody just asked me recently, when I was showing them the archival photos, they said, you don't have any pictures of your family at your mother's fashion shows. I said, no, why would we do that? You know, because to us, that was her work. Mm -mm. And to my dad, that's not our family life. You know, so we were raised in a very low-key, sort of keep away from the press kind of thing. That's why I had to get used to it. Now, as a, as a mentor in school, there were four people I know who, who worked. Well, they studied in her school and then she took them under her wing as apprentices. One of them was Oscar Peralta, who was the first graduate of the school in 1961. The second one passed away, Eddie Ocampo. They both worked for her. In fact, she was pregnant with my sister. So when they saw Sandy, you know, a few years ago, they were like, oh my God, you're all grown up. And you know, the third was Cesar Galpo. And the fourth was a guy called Henry Paul, who was her last apprentice. Uh, this was like late 70s up to the, the very, the, up to the early 80s. All of them say the same thing. They were always obsessing over how she dressed. They learned a lot from her in terms of color and line. And Henry, I just spoke to him a few months ago. I said, what exactly but did you learn from my mom? I mean, did you really learn so much from her? He said, everything I know, you know, he, he said, I learned discipline. And I, he said, I learned how she looked at things. He said, because she always looked at things and thought, how can we make this modern? Because she was, what one of the art critics I know referred to my mom as a modernist. You know, she wasn't interested in making costumes. She made real clothes for real people, as outrageous as that might be. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know what, I'll tell you something. I don't think she thought that way. Like, like when my sister and I did the Slims book, I was telling people my mom is not the sort of person, she would never have sat down and done a coffee table book about herself. <laughs> She didn't have that kind of ego. And the school is, I think she thought it was a great idea. And my mom was always very fascinated by young minds and young creative minds. Because like even my friends when we were baguettes and going out dancing and whatever, she always wanted to see what everyone was wearing, you know. And you know what? She never once ever mentioned to my sister or myself that we should take over the school. Nothing. I don't think she thought about legacy. Mm -hmm. She wasn't self-aware in that sense. I think she just did things because she wanted to. And, and really, as a creative person, the most important thing to her was the work. You know, so much so that now, for example, you have a lot of designers that become sometimes more famous than their clients. My mom, on the other hand, always used to tell us, I make their clothes, because you weren't talking about Manila society. She goes, I provide a service, I make them their clothes, I'm not one of them. 
So she always drew that distinction. And, and so our home life was just a normal family. No. I mean, my God, when, when I finally brought those two Theranos to the Victor and Albert Museum, I thought, wow, if, if, I mean, what a great thing to happen for a designer from the Philippines that her work is in the VNA. But she would have been amused, you know, even winning the National Artist thing. Mm -hmm. I never heard her mention it even once, you know, because the, the award began in around, I think, 1972. She never talked. To, she wasn't interested. Now, if she was alive today and won it, she'd go and accept it. She'd be very amused. But it was really, really all about the work. I think, you know, it was all about the work and all about, if you look at uh, their press interviews with some of our alumni and, and young graduates mm -hmm. like yourself, all of them say the same thing. It's hard work. It's very meticulous. You know, it's all the, 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 the craftsmanship, no shortcuts. I think that's probably what she would impart because she didn't believe in shortcuts. And, and I think in a sense, that's why her work is so has survived and, and, and is admired by people because it's not, it's not shop, it's not uh, smoke and mirrors, it's the real thing. So I would imagine that's what she would say. And then, also, you know, she'd give some of the alumni little snippets of um, um, advice, like Oscar Peralta told me some random stuff. He said, oh, you know, your mom always taught me that if you're going to use two bright colors in a dress, Add a third color that's a neutral to sort of balance it. So there's that, you know. Hard question to answer right now because we're just slowly emerging from one of the most devastating global crises in our lifetime. So it's kind of a, you know, I'm, I'm, I was just talking in the office about education institutions and how they suffered through the pandemic and you know, as you're aware that the question of should we do face to face, are we, mm -hmm. you know, so it's, it's a hard question to answer right now. I think we're still finding our way, but at the, this particular moment in time, we're purely online. And what that has achieved is something that we never would have achieved through face to face, which is now people from all over the country can enroll. And we have uh, one third of the student population is now overseas. So, so we're still kind of finding our way or finding our footing in a new world, if you will. 